we are live. We're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Cloud English Live. My name is Luke, and we have a lot of interesting things planned today. So it's good to have everybody here. I hope you're looking forward to it. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Right at the start, if you want to show support, check out the links in the description. I've got full courses there to help you improve your English. Also, uh, depending on where you're watching, but if you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Otherwise, follow wherever you happen to be. Today, we're going to be talking about books. I'm going to be doing a bit of a book review later of a book I've read recently. And we'll also be doing an English Q&A. So that should be interesting. And as I said, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are as well. We'll be getting started shortly. I mean, we'll really be getting started, actually starting. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. So if you have questions about English learning, best practices, tips, strategies, difficulties, pronunciation, culture, idioms, phrases, whatever it may be, feel free to just ask and I'll do my best to answer. And as I said, later we'll be getting into uh, some book stuff. Well, I, I want to do a, basically a book review because I uh, recently finished a book and I want to share it. Is that a crime? Is it a crime to share what I've read? I don't think so. Maybe it is. Someone check that. Someone check if it's a crime to share what I've read. Crime check, please. Can I get a crime check on that? And I'm drinking my, my new favorite beverage. I really like this stuff. I'm not sponsored by this, but I really like this stuff because um, it's called spin, spin, spin drift, spin drift. Because it, instead of being artificially flavored, it has real juice inside. But it's such a tiny amount of juice that it's just for flavor. So it's real juice, but it's very, very little. So it's really sparkling water with a teeny, 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 tiny bit of, bit of juice. So that means there's very, very little sugar, very few carbs. Um, uh, so, But it's still tasty. And it's sparkling. So it's nice to drink. I like it. I like it a lot. All right. Um, let's see who we've got here. Nihat is here. Hello. It has been a while. Well, I mean, I've 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 been here. I've been here the whole time. I don't know what I don't know where you've been, Nihat. I've been here. We've been doing these quite, in fact, quite regularly. Our live streams. You watch the replays to uh, time to time, from time to time, and get inspired as well. Oh, glad to hear it. Glad to hear that. Who else do we have here? Say hello as you join. Again, questions, comments, concerns, issues. We'll be kicking that off shortly. Today, it's uh, starting to get cold, actually. It's, I would say, getting close to autumn. Usually, I have the air conditioner on. No air conditioner today. It's starting to feel a little bit a little bit cold, the need for more layers. Some people love the sun and love when it's hot outside and love being outdoors. For whatever reason, I'm just not built that way. I don't love the outdoors. Not really. It's OK. Uh, but the indoors are pretty great, too. Uh, I could kind of care, care less when it comes to uh, uh, going to the beach. I mean, I'll go, but I don't care. I don't need to go to the beach. I don't really want to go to the beach. The sun is very bright. Uh, not a big fan. And when I go outside, especially in the summertime, it's so hot that it makes me feel like I'm melting, even if it's not that hot. To me, it feels hot. Even a little bit hot feels hot. 
I feel like I'm melting. I get very lethargic and slow. And so I usually just go in indoors then. I'm, I'm concerned that I might be allergic to summer, the season of summer, maybe. Because then in winter, I'm very alert, sharp. Autumn, I like. Autumn is coming. Very alert, very sharp, very clear-minded. I don't feel sluggish. I don't feel lethargic. I feel, I feel great. This is what I like. This is why I don't live in a place like Florida or Hawaii, which is all hot all the time. I mean, I love Thailand, one of my favorite places to visit, but it's hot all the time. Well, it's at least warm all the time. So I can't live there, you know. What is the meaning of lit? Oh, good one. Karina hates winter. Well, you know what, Karina? To each their own, I say. Yeah, we'll t we can talk about lit. That's a good one. I'm going to bring up uh, the Urban Dictionary meaning too, because that might provide us a little bit more context. How do I improve academic writing? Uh, would you help? Yes. Yes, that's a good question too. We'll get to these guys. These are good questions. We've got two great questions. Have I read Robinson Crusoe? Yeah, I read Robinson Crusoe, I think when I was in middle school, maybe? Maybe when I was around 12 or 13 years old, I think I read that one. It's about a man who gets stranded, I believe, on an island and has to survive on his own survival skills. Um, I could be wrong, but I think the Disney movie from the 1960s called The Swiss Family Robinson or Robinsons. Robinsons or Robinson? I can't remember. I believe that is from or based on... Robinson Crusoe. I could be wrong. That's just an assumption I've always made. It could be a dumb assumption. Not sure. That's one thing I'd like to do is go, I want to do one topic where we go over uh, classic, classic movies, sort of the mu the movies that shaped my childhood. I'd like to go over those personal favorite classics. Uh, Nivia is here from Rio. Hello. Well, I guess now we're sort of in a transitional period. If you're, if you're down there, right? So springtime, right? In Rio, correct? Um, early spring, is that right? Because you're in the southern hemisphere. I haven't spent a lot of time in the Southern Hemisphere. I've been to the Southern Hemisphere a few times, uh, but I haven't spent a lot of time there. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of... I just want to pull up something for the lit question. Lit. Urban Dictionary. Use Urban Dictionary at your own peril. I mean, you have to be careful. <clears throat> <clears throat> you have to be careful because you just never know what you're going to find. Some things may disturb you. Okay, this one's pretty good. I'm just grabbing a few. Um, okay, yeah, I would not probably not like real For the heat alone, I can't make any comment about it, of course. <clears throat> Hmm, lit. <clears throat> lit up. Ooh, that one I'm not not so familiar with. I'll go with the top definition here. That's not bad. <laughs> All right. Um, look in on. We've got a lot of good questions here. Awesome. Great to have everybody here again. 
for those just joining, my name is Luke. Welcome to Cloud English Live. We're going to be doing today a uh, uh, discussion of uh, books and also uh, Q&A, English Q&A. So, um, so if you're here live, that's great. If you're watching later, well, what are you doing? Join live. Then you can ask your questions uh, and we'll get to as many as we can. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. That helps the channel significantly, especially hitting the like button, honestly. And there are full courses in the links in the description. You can check those out as well. Naomi says, happy we have some Brazilians in here. Yes. It's hard to do a live stream without Brazilians. I've always said that. Maybe impossible. Okay, so where's where's the lit question? We'll get to that one first. Where's the lit one? Yeah, here we go. Rula Abu Hassan says, hey, Luke, hope you're well. I am, thank you. Although eh, I'm feeling a little fuzzy today, honestly, if I'm being totally honest. What is the meaning of lit? I've been hearing it a lot lately. Yes, so this is a good one, and I believe it's important to know everything, not necessarily use everything. When it comes to language, it's it's really, even in one whole language, separated in different ways. There are different levels and different circles. So one would be something like your nationality, where... The UK would have a different culture and they would use different language compared to the United States, but also regional, right? So East Coast, West Coast, that sort of thing, but also generational. So younger people, older people, boomers, millennials, Gen Z, Gen X, right? These are also different, let's say, levels of language usage. Now, there's one that I would say is below me. So there, maybe we can do another topic on the generations uh, in, in the future, but there's one that's under me, and they're called Gen Z. And I'm in the millennial generation. And one word that's quite common among Gen Z, uh, that's a broad category, certainly not everybody, you can't say everyone uses it, is the term lit. So I know it, but I, I probably won't use it because I feel it's a little awkward for me to use something that I don't feel part of socially and culturally. It's the same way that I don't say things that my grandmother says. She has some expressions like, oh, that's neato. She says that quite often. It's very cute, and I love that for her, but I don't say it. And she would probably never say, awesome. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. I've, I've never heard her say that. She's from a different generation. I say it because that's something that's common among millennials. Okay, so with that context out of the way, what does lit mean? If you hear someone say it, putting aside whether you should use it or not, what does it mean? Better to know. Lit means good, awesome, great. That's what it means. It means something is very good. That's lit. So you hear a song? A new song, and then you, someone says, what do you think? And you say, it's, it's lit. <laughs> For anything. It's something you do, right? An activity. How was that? How was the, uh, how was the uh, escape room? It was lit. Okay. Let's look at, and I give you this resource with some trepidation. Let's look at the Urban Dictionary. This is a dictionary that's not an official dictionary like Webster's or um, uh, the Oxford Dictionary. It's one that it's 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 peer generated. People people make it. Anybody can post on Urban Dictionary, post a definition with examples, right? It's it's kind of a, a wiki in that way. So uh, let's pop up a couple of definitions for lit that are on Urban Dictionary. First one here. Lit. 
this I think is quite funny. And the reason I think it's funny is that uh, it doesn't really explain itself <laughs> because you might not know the other terms because they're also not common unless you're in that generation. This may be intentional, by the way. Lit, when something is turned up <laughs> or popping. John, did you go to that party last night? And then, yes, that shit was lit, which means it was awesome. So turned up or popping would be other Gen Z words that I probably wouldn't wouldn't use. And again, it's, it's not that I can't. It's just I would feel uncomfortable. You shouldn't use everything that you learn necessarily because maybe it just doesn't sound right uh, coming out of your mouth. I'm I'm an old man, so I, I shouldn't be saying things that the kids are saying, right? 53 years old. Here's another one from Urban Dictionary. What millennials use, and I, I would like to say that I don't think that's true. I don't think that this is millennials. I really think this should be below millennials because I don't hear a lot of millennials, which is my generation, saying this one. What millennials use when describing that that is fire or dope. And some people say fire. Dope is fairly common. I sometimes use that. Well, that's dope. I sometimes do it just joking, but... Meaning cool or awesome. So there you go. Meaning cool or awesome. Uh, so someone says, hey, bro, want some weed? And then the other person says, yo, that that shit lit, bruh. Let me add it. That means I want it. <laughs> I think this one, they're, they're trying to be funny with the examples. Often they are, tr they are trying to be funny with the examples. So that's uh, that's what it means. And the, the question, the important question then, now that you know the meaning is so simple is should you use it up to you you can do whatever you want i won't and that's because it just doesn't feel right for me to use it because i feel like it's not within i feel too old to say it basically is what i'm saying all right great question by the way hey, if you guys haven't already done so of course don't forget to hit the like button or the thumbs up and subscribe and you can check out my full courses as well in the links in the description by the way those are on sale um, you can get the yearly membership at a 20 percent discount if you check that out great question great question a lit question you could say that question was lit <laughs> have I made a video about the magic E I, I don't call it the magic E, but I have, although I would say not on YouTube. It's in one of my courses, especially for pronunciation. I spend quite a bit of time talking about it in my latest course, which is called uh, Advanced American English Pronunciation. So you can check that out also in the links in the description. That one is a eight and a half hour course on the topic of pronunciation, and it includes the silent E. Okay. Please in, please give us advice on increasing brain stamina when speaking English for a long time on Zoom sessions. Oh, that's an interesting one. Brain stamina. I don't, uh, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. I'm feeling, I'm not feeling so, I'm not feeling great today. To be totally honest, I'm a little, I feel a little fuzzy. I don't know. I have some seasonal allergies. I don't know. But I do want to answer the Vissel's question about academic writing because it's a good one. Vissel says, how do I improve academic writing English, Luke? Would books help? Well, books always help, right? And I don't, knew, I don't know if by that question you mean books about how to write academic English or you mean reading books in general. But you can read a lot and still not be a good writer. But there is an exercise you can do to improve your writing using books. So it would be as simple as you take a paragraph from a book you're reading. You think it's well constructed, it's clear, you like how it sounds. Maybe you like the syntax. Then you try a couple of different things. First, you write using the same basic grammar of the paragraph, the same basic sentence structures. You write something similar. 
totally different meaning, that's fine. Maybe you maybe you write about something completely different. The content is different, but you follow the same structure and you try to use the same style of sentences. A good writer will have great syntax. And syntax means the variety of different sentences that you use and how you use them, right? So uh, maybe you can learn about syntax, you can learn about structure, and you can learn the correct construction of the grammar of sentences in that way. Another exercise you can do is to take that same paragraph and do a variation. Try to write the same meaning in your own way. Completely different structure, completely different flow, but keep the meaning the same. So variations and then using or modeling your sentences based on the original paragraph are two great things you can do to work on your English using pretty much any any book as long as it's complicated enough, right? If it's if it's a uh, Bob went to the market, eh, maybe not. So that's one thing. The other part of that was I think can just reading in general help me in the background, yes. As I said, you can read a lot and still not be a great writer. You are absorbing structures and sentences when you read, but it really is happening in the background, and it's not a great way to improve in the short term. I always recommend reading. Reading is a great thing to do. It can make you more aware of the language. You'll actually pick up quite a lot of things if you become a good reader. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will become a good writer, right? So maybe not the best way for the short term. Now, what about writing? Um, what about writing books, books about writing? So for that one, there is a book. It's called The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. Of Let me just pull up a picture of it so you can see what it looks like. And I, I recommend it to everybody. I've probably read the book uh, more than 10 times. It's, I don't know how many times I've read it, probably a lot. Uh, it's a great book. My father is a writer, and he forced me to read this book when I was a teenager, and I'm glad that I did. William Strunk uh, Jr. and E.B. White, The Elements of Style. This book will teach you how to write clearly and concisely even native English speakers, many native English speakers, write very poorly because they don't know how to be clear and concise with their writing, and it's too bad. Read this book a few times, and you'll start to get a sense for how to put your thoughts into writing clearly with clarity. So those are two things that you can start with. Uh, academic writing, really the only difference between that and, let's say, regular writing, prose or emails. Academic writing has a lot of jargon often uh, that's specific to the topic that it's about. And also in academic writing, the structure tends to be a bit more formal and rigid. So you have a specific structure to follow. But if you do the exercise where you take some academic papers and you study the structure, uh, and then you try to do something along those lines following the same structure, you'll get a sense for, for that. And it's different for different disciplines. It's different for different kinds of, uh, or different areas in uh, academia. So, um, you know, starting with reading a lot of academic papers would be a good, uh, a good beginning point. So I hope that answers your question at least somewhat. Vissel, it's a good one. Uh, the best thing you can do at this point is just practice, practice, practice. Try your best and try to get feedback. Have a peer, someone who's also working on their English who can give you feedback. Maybe you set up a feedback buddy relationship where you have an assignment every Thursday. You send them your assignment and they send you theirs and you give each other feedback. That's a great way to also push yourself a little bit and, uh, and, and get a lot of useful feedback to improve your writing over time. So hope that helps, and again, don't forget to uh, subscribe, hit the like button, and check out my full courses in the links in the description. I'm going to be releasing a writing course, a full writing course, later this year. I'm very excited for that. <coughs> Actually, this may sound crazy. I'm releasing three writing courses 
may, maybe not all this year, but I've recorded three separate courses on writing, believe it or not. I know, that sounds crazy. HJK6, is there a phrase as is only used on singular objects and to refer to conditions in the present? Can I say as are, as was, as were, as will be? Hmm. <clears throat> singular objects. <coughs> Let me think about that for a second. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a tough one, but I'll I'll do my best to answer this one because I it's a good it's a really good question. <clears throat> What's the topic? Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Oglum. We're going to be talking about. I'm going to be doing uh, sharing a book that I read recently that I want to possibly recommend, and also uh, uh, doing a Q and A, so answering questions, whatever you want to talk about, really. Naomi, I see your questions. I will try to get to those as well. You have quite a few there. I'll, I'll do my best. Goseb, is that right? Greetings from Colombia. Hello. Colombia is awesome. Ah, a couple people from Colombia. Awesome. I've only been to one place in Colombia, though. I went to Medellin in Colombia. Uh, I have a video about that. You can check that out. It's called, uh, I think, Where Coffee Comes From is the name of the video. I did a coffee tour in Colombia, and that was, that was great fun. I enjoyed that. All right. Yeah, let's try to get to this one. This is a this is a tough a tough tough question. H J K six says, "Hi Luke. Is the phrase as is only used on singular objects and to refer to conditions in the present? Can I say as are, as was, as were, as will be?" Okay. So. Kind of, yes. The phrase as is by itself is the only one we can use. And we would use it for usually a single thing uh, that is happening in the present, as HJK6 has, has said. So what would be an example of that? So there's a situation going on, and we describe the situation situation as an it. Okay, so I've decided. Let's let's say the situation is like this. Um, there is a disagreement between two colleagues, and I could get involved and try to help them, but I've decided to leave it as is. That means I'm not going to mess with it. This situation. So the situation is an it. So there you could say, well, th that's not really an it, though, because you're there are two people, right? But you can use a lot of, you can sometimes group things into a bigger piece and call it an it then, a whole situation, a team, a company, made up of individuals, yes, but leave it as is, this whole thing. We can also, of course, use it for, for objects, right? So you're building a house and something isn't quite like you like it right maybe the siding is not not your favorite and i'm speaking from uh experience here <laughs> so you know what rather than spend a huge amount of money 
so that I can have my favorite thing, I've just decided to leave it as is. That might be the physical thing, or that could refer to that decision, whoever made the decision to put my put the siding there, that's not my favorite. That decision, I'm going to leave that as is. We could also say that's the situation. So it's pretty pretty flexible there, right? It, the situation, it, the decision, or it, the physical object, the sighting. <clears throat> you made an artwork, a painting, and you want to fix it. No, no, don't fix it. Leave it as is. It's beautiful as is. Don't touch it. Don't mess it up. Okay. Now, do we describe plural things in that way? Well, in the way that I talked about, yes, because situations and groups and teams although they are single things, contain more, right? But we usually refer to them in their collective form, like a team is a collective, singular collective made of parts. If you wanted to use are or were or was, you can, but no longer just as and that, as are, for example, as was, as were. We don't use those. Now, sometimes you hear, as was the final act, as was the final act. Okay, that's a, that's a different kind of different usage, and let's not get into that. But in this general meaning of keep it, keep it in the way that it is, if we want to start using are or was or were, then we would probably, uh, we would probably add something. So we would say, leave things as they are. So we put they in between instead of leave, leave things as are. If it's an is, then we say as is. We could say as it is, right? That's correct. Leave it as it is. Leave the painting as it is. Don't mess it up. Or we say leave it as is. Leave everything as is. The house was a mess and we left it as is. Um, as is meaning it's still like that, even though it was a mess. So if you want to change it, usually we'll then put the um, put the they, for example, with the with with uh, were inside between the two as they were. We left everything as it was. We left all of the things as they were. The team was left as they were as they were. What about was? Yeah, that would be fine too. Uh, we decided to just keep it as it was. So if you use the past tense there, we would then put it there. We wouldn't say as was. Same with, uh, same with will be, as it will be. I guess you could use that too. But you would put in whatever you want to use, you would put in the it, the they, in between. Whereas you don't have to do that when it is is. We can remove the it and just say as is, and that's fine. It's a tough question, HJK6. I hope that gives you a better sense for it. It's a very useful uh, way of describing situations and states and conditions and what you think about them. If you guys haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button, of course, subscribe, and check out my full courses in the links in the description. Good question. Good question, but a tough one, I have to say. Vitali is here. Hey, Luke. Uh, why is your channel called Cloud English? Why don't you put your real name in the title? I don't know. Well, Cloud English is uh, is a company. My company is called Cloud English, and uh, the company sells online courses. That's what Cloud English does. It's an online course company. Um, my company. Yash, hello from India. Hello, me. Hi, everyone. Hello. as the final act was. Right, so you have the final act in between instead of as it was. That would be totally okay. That's good. Why was your, why is it called Cloud English though? Cloud English came out of, I believe I came up with a name. 
<clears throat> when I was traveling in Nepal, I decided I'm going to start a company. Was I in Nepal? I was somewhere. I don't remember exactly. And I thought cloud, another meaning of cloud is, uh, well, so a, cl a cloud is something that floats above, above the ground in a way that it, you know, it's kind of light and free rather than being stuck and slow and dragged down by because I was frustrated by the way people traditionally learn English with a lot of books and studying and memorizing words uh, I was quite frustrated by that and so I wanted I knew that that wasn't the best way to learn for people so I decided to create Cloud English as a way to give people a sense of uh, reality and lightness and that you know it's it should be more playful and I think cl clouds tend to be more playful but the other thing was that uh, around that time it was becoming quite popular to use cloud for online things right so I knew it was going to be an online company um, with online courses uh, and so it made sense that you learn English in the cloud. The cloud is the internet as well. So double meaning. I like that one. That's because the cloud English can rain easy. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. A lot of people from Brazil here today. That's cool. Brazil is one of the has uh, a huge number of people learning English in Brazil. I know that for a fact. I've seen the data. It's like India, China, and Brazil are at the top. What's the difference between hilarious, ridiculous, and ludicrous? Well, hilarious is quite different than the other two. Hilarious just means very funny. Ridiculous and ludicrous could be crazy or unbelievable. They're also quite similar. <clears throat> Don't worry, Naomi, I will get to uh, your questions, but I want to talk about this one. What type of books like romance, science fiction, do you recommend that are easy to read for non-English speakers? So, in fact, science fiction, romance, these are fiction. The broader category is fiction, right? You have to be careful about fiction because it's often written with the purpose of creating images and style. And the characters often speak with a lot of uh, idioms and phrases that you might not know. And the characters may have they may write it with a with an with an accent phonetic spelling of the character's speech right so in fact in general i don't recommend english learners start with any fiction now if you really like fiction go ahead and try things like harry potter not that difficult not that difficult to read honestly but in general, if you want a category, I would recommend nonfiction. Now, you have to choose that carefully as well, but nonfiction at least is written with the intention, with the purpose of being understood by as many people as possible. While as the, the purpose of fiction is to tell a story in a beautiful way, to paint pictures in your mind, right? That's what fiction is for. Nonfiction is for communicating to you. Now, I prefer nonfiction anyway. Uh, that could include a lot of different things, of course. I prefer nonfiction anyway, but it really is more clear. So, if you're interested in a topic, whatever it may be, see if you can find a nonfiction book about that thing. See if you can find a nonfiction book about history, if you're interested in history, a historical event, right? See if you can find a nonfiction book that's more self-help self, self -help related. 
see if you can find a nonfiction book that's about a topic that uh, that you would like to study more and you know something about it already and you want to you want to uh, get more knowledge about that so maybe it's a personal finance book or investing uh, or uh, maybe business related or work related maybe about leadership right I always recommend uh, the book called um, Multipliers, which is a great book, easy to read. Or someone who's starting a business, Zero to One, amazing book, very easy to read, not difficult. Now, if you hate nonfiction, and that's really not your thing, fine, all right, I mean, read fiction. But make sure it's the right level. If it's too basic and too easy, you're not challenging yourself if it's extremely difficult and you know you're reading uh, very high level literature then like maybe you're reading uh, something by Dostoevsky or something that's going to probably wear you out and it's going to be too much hard work probably too much hard work I just finished reading Faust uh, Goethe's Faust translated into English of course but written in the poetic style it's awful I mean, it's it's important. It's an important work, but the experience of reading it was not. Oh wow, beautiful literature! I I didn't feel that way. It was. I had to really concentrate the whole time. Okay, what is this? What's happening here? What's happening now? Okay, I I was really trying to pay attention to, because it's it's very poetic, but that's fiction, right? Faust is fiction, so you just have to. You just have to choose carefully, right? I always recommend as a general sort of start with something, read Harry Potter. Harry Potter books, there are many of them, so you can follow the whole story. It's written for young adults, teens and young adults at that level, so it's not too difficult, and you should be able to get through it with uh, enough understanding. So that's a good starting place if you insist on reading fiction. That's my advice. Um... Let me know. Let me know what kind of stuff you you like to read. I'm interested in hearing books that uh, you feel are at your your level. You don't want to understand everything. If you understand nothing, that's too hard. Find that find that perfect balance. And uh, yeah, let me let me know uh, what you what you end up uh, going with. Guys, just a quick reminder: if you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Also, check out my full English courses in the links in the description and there's a uh, annual membership for all my courses 12 courses 20% uh, off the annual membership so that's good I would say that's good Lord of the Rings Naomi's reading Lord of the Rings almost gave up on ESL yet yeah, Lord of the Rings may be a little too challenging I would maybe not do those. Okay. Luke, is it right to say, aren't I? Yeah, sure. That's part of what we call a tag question, Gabriel. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm on the team, aren't I? I'm on the team, aren't I? That's a tag question. Or you could start the sentence that way. Aren't I on the team? I'm on the team, aren't I? Notice that the tag question, you always have the opposite, the negation in the part after the comma. I'm not on the team, am I? I'm on the team. Aren't I? It's always the opposite. It's always the negation. Fuzzy. That's a new word for me. Good to know about it. Fuzzy. Yes, that is a good one. I like to use the word fuzzy. Let's see here. Naomi's got a question.
Naomi says, second question is about please. I've seen a sentence saying something like, do it if you please. And I noticed it was using please as want. Is that right? Uh, in this in this case, yes, it's quite formal. If you've made a request and someone has agreed to that request, you might just say, if you please, or follow me if you please. But it's quite formal. You often see it in movies when it's a, a, a butler standing by the door. Ah, yeah, you've arrived. Oh, follow, please, this way. Or follow me if you please. I will take you to the, the dungeon, the torture dungeon, uh, or wherever the butler takes you. Right? So if you please is so formal that I don't think, and it does mean, by the way, Naomi, if you want to. That's what it means. If you want to. If you would like to. Um, if you don't mind, it's sort of like that. If you don't mind, if you if you would like to, if it's okay with you, if that's fine, if it, the long version is, if it pleases you to do so, if you please, if it pleases you to do so. So that's what it means. And you, again, you'll see it in movies if you make a request of someone. I wonder if you could, I uh, wonder if you could, fill in this this form if you please or fill in the form if you please or have a snack if you please have a have a slice of cheese if you please <laughs> a slice of cheese if you please or again as i said once someone has agreed to something but again so formal that i don't think i've ever actually used it in my entire life maybe as a joke maybe t to sound extra formal it's like it's like you're talking to royalty you know it's so formal so i would avoid it in general but that's just me that's just me i mean i can't tell you how to communicate best thing to do is look at more examples if you want to get a sense for a phrase or a word what you can do is just google it and you can then see dialogue articles example sentences where it's used and get a sense for What's more important, actually, than the simple meaning of it, meaning is one thing. The more important thing is what's the connotation, what's the context, how is it used, how often is it used, who uses it. All of these things are questions of usage, and they're more important because it doesn't matter how many words you know, you only want to use ones that allow you to communicate effectively. Will this allow you to communicate effectively? If you say to me, for example, uh, grab something from the refrigerator, if you please. I will feel very uncomfortable if you say that to me. I, I, maybe I'm a guest in your home, right? And you use, if you please, to me. Instead of, feel free to grab something from the fridge to drink. Oh, then I'm comfortable. Sure. Thank you. I will. But if you say, grab something to drink from the refrigerator, if you please, I will start to think, okay, uh... Was I lured here? Am I going to be killed? Um, what's something is wrong? Something is off. I'll think. You know, it'll it'll scare me. It'll frighten me. I'll feel frightened because there's a level of formality I'm not used to, and it makes me uncomfortable. I think most people would feel that way. So you might hear it most often in reality in situations where someone is mocking that that level of formality as a joke to say it like that. So hopefully that helps. Naomi, hopefully that makes sense. Guys, don't forget to uh, hit the like button. That really helps out the channel. You can also subscribe. And if you really want to, check out my courses in the links in the description. Hey. Sure, Gerardo, I have a confusing question. What is the difference between a degree in linguistics and an English degree? Uh, well, that's pretty simple. I mean, linguistic, linguistics is, is the field of languages in general. But English, an English degree, is specifically for the English language. Now, there are different English degrees as well. There's literature. There's English writing. There is a degree in teaching English as a second language, also called ESL. So there's that. And then linguistics is more about how languages function, how they, how they uh, evolve, uh, how they work in general, uh, the grammar of languages. Linguistics is more broad than just the English language.
A Hundred Years of Solitude is a great novel. I've heard of that. Uh, Orozco says, the first book I read was Carrie by Stephen King, and even though it has some technical difficult words, I understood the book almost completely in current reading Gone Girl. Ooh, Gone Girl. I haven't read the book, but I've seen the movie, and it's terrifying. But good, good advice. Fairy tales are really hard to read, says Gabriel. Yes, they are. I agree. Completely agree. Don't read fairy tales. Uh, let's see. 100 Years of Solitude. That's a very familiar title. Hmm. Very familiar. I don't know where I've heard that before. All right, I'll check that out. Thank you for sharing. Please explain what accountability and leverage means in a tweet. Arm yourself with specific uh, specific knowledge, accountability, and leverage. I would need even more context, Vitali, to answer this question. I need even more context because leverage, leverage in particular has different meanings in different situations. Uh, I mean, there's one that's related to investing. There's one that's related to politics. There's, I mean, so many different uh, possible meanings. So uh, I would need, I need even more context than what you've given me here to answer that one correctly. Uh, this is a good question from Esme. Esme says, hi, how can I start a conversation and keep it going? And any advice for beginners to start in YouTube? Do you see it's a good idea to share thoughts and ideas in English from non-native speakers? So two great things here. Number one is getting a conversation started. Should you ask about the weather? How's the weather? Well, of course you can, but a better rule is if you're in a situation where conversations are possible, a Zoom call, a meetup, a coffee shop, a friend introduces you to someone, traveling, someone who looks like they're lost. I mean, all of these are situations where conversations can begin. The first thing is to, to not try to force it. You don't want to force someone to have a conversation. So there will be times when you may try to initiate a conversation and then the other person's body language kind of tells you that they're not really interested in speaking with you. In that case, just let it go, I would suggest. But how do you actually begin a conversation with someone who really wants to have a conversation? Should you come up with topics? And think about, okay, let me come up with five different topics so I can talk about those things when I meet this person or when I meet someone. Or maybe you have a general list of topics that you can talk about. I, When I meet someone, I will talk to them about movies. I saw a movie recently. My favorite video game is, of course not. Why? Well, why would someone you don't know well want to hear about what you think about anything? So what is the key to making somebody want to talk to you. Really, it's if you show interest in them and you're focused on listening rather than saying things. If you're focused on saying things, then you'll quickly run out of stuff to say and the other person feels like they're just an excuse for you to talk. But if you are interested in them, then the whole situation is reversed. They feel someone is genuinely interested in them and they open up. They would like to start sharing. And this is the key to starting really good conversations and in fact, beginning friendships. So how do you do that? Whenever you're in a situation, let's say you don't know people, you're with a group of people you don't know and you wanna start a conversation. First, you ask yourself, what are the things unique to this situation 
that I share with all of these people. Let's say it's three people together, including me. Okay? And we are waiting for something. We're waiting in line for something, right? Maybe we're waiting in line to get into the DMV. That's where you get your driver's license, okay? And the line is moving very slowly. There's only three people in line, but it's moving so slowly for whatever reason. So I would ask myself, all right, what, I'm asking myself this, what do I share with these people? Well, maybe we all live in this city because here we are getting this, our driver's licenses here, okay? We probably live not far away, so we probably all kind of live nearby, maybe. Uh, that's an assumption. We're all doing something related to getting a driver's license, whether it's renewing one or getting a new one or something like that, okay? We all either drive a car or will be driving a car soon, okay? So there's something car related. We're all waiting in line, which is kind of annoying because the line is moving so slowly. So we're all kind of in an inconvenient situation that's not great. And there are more. There are tons of things. So if you identify some of these things, then you start a conversation not with, let me tell you what I think about the situation. Instead, you make an innocent comment that the other people will feel they understand, they agree with that they can make another comment related to it, or they might have said the same thing. Something that's a pretty safe bet, right? Like, maybe I make a simple comment like, online it said the wait would only be 10 minutes. We've been here for 45. Did yours say the same? So I make a comment, then I could maybe ask a question after it. Did yours say the same, uh, say the same thing? Maybe your notice that you got when you made your appointment to go to the DMV. Yeah, mine said it would also be only a 10 minute, 15 minute wait. We've been here forever. Okay, now we have some common ground, right? And that's great. But I could start with just a question. So comments are good if they're, you don't want to make them too strong, right? Like, I, you know, I hate the world <laughs> because of I'm waiting in line. I mean, you just want to be careful about comments. You want to make it fairly innocent and something that you, you feel like most people probably... Uh, will agree with and feel like they have the same experience as you. Or just start with a question. Okay, well, what kind of question? All right, we're at the DMV. And this is just a situation I suddenly came up with uh, in the back of, just sort of in, in, off the top of my head. Or the back of my head. Doesn't matter where it comes from. I, in fact, I was in this situation not long ago. And I was in line. And it was moving slowly. So maybe that's why. So what kind of thing? Well, I could say, I could make an assumption in a question. I could say, are you here to, are you here to renew your license? Or maybe it took me a month to make a reservation because it's so difficult to make reservations. Say, um, maybe, uh, how long in advance did you have to book your reservation? Oh, I had to book, I had to book this two months in advance. Wow. Uh, COVID has really made things uh, quite, quite inconvenient at the DMV. Yes, I know. And then the conversation starts, right? COVID is kind of a common situation for everybody. So that's a free uh, conversation starter. But the key thing is to find the thing that you have in common, find the common ground, then comment or question. And then for the whole conversation, at least for the beginning part, toward the beginning, focus on asking questions and making comments, questions and comments. Don't, don't start, you know, talking and talking and talking. If you see the other person listening like this and nodding, they're probably just being polite. Instead, show interest, show genuine interest in the other person. And you'll find that it's quite easy to connect with others. And it's quite easy to uh, keep the conversation going. So that's that part of the question. The other part of the question is about starting YouTube, which is a totally different topic. So maybe it would be best to answer that question uh, separately and, uh, and at another time. It is a great question, but um, uh, let's, let's keep it at that for, for now. If you guys haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe, of course, and check out my full courses in the links in the description.
I will answer this question, the second part of this question, though, because it's, it's also good. Uh, name, surname, 122. Two. Oh, that's a great name. Wonderful. Basically, it's a tweet thread with advice and ideas on how to get rich. Ah, okay. So, leveraging and investing. Okay. Thanks for your American R video. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Muhammad, you're late. Unacceptable. Unacceptably late. Ah! So I want to get to my book thing. Carlin, Carlin, don't worry, it's okay, it's fine. But I want to I want to finish answering Esme's question first. So Esme asked a question about getting conversations started and then asks how do I start a YouTube channel for beginners? Is it a good idea to share thoughts and ideas in English uh, from non-native speakers? There are many non-native speakers on YouTube. Of course, probably way more than native speakers. So, absolutely. Now, is it a good idea? Is it good practice to start a YouTube channel? Channel. I think everybody should start a YouTube channel, honestly. Everybody has something to say. You have an interest, a viewpoint, ideas, knowledge, whatever it is, you have something that other people don't have that you can share. And that's quite powerful. That can be a YouTube channel. I would strongly recommend, if you're gonna do a YouTube channel, first figure out what things you have to say and what things you can talk about that others will find interesting or useful. You have to provide value. If you don't provide any value, then people won't watch, okay? So providing value is really, really important. Uh, if you're just vlogging, for example, and you're just showing your your life, um, it, it, it's tough. It's gonna be probably more tough because then you have to, you have to work really hard at uh, the technical side and the video side. Let's say you just wanna start a channel to talk about an interest. Maybe your interest is building Legos, Maybe your interest is in uh, UFC. I, I don't know what your interest is, but you want to talk about that. Follow your interest, definitely. Don't try to do something that you have no interest in, okay? Now, does it help from the English lang language standpoint? Absolutely, absolutely. Having conversations can feel like you're under pressure, and that pressure is usually a positive thing because it gets you used to speaking in a live situation, you have to use language creatively. You're not just sitting there studying and remembering words. And that pressure then allows you to gain confidence over time and you start to get more comfortable using all of the things that you know. Often, when you haven't had many conversations, you get stuck because you're nervous, right? So the more conversations you have, the more comfortable, confident you get, the better you can start speaking. Great. But if you can take that to the next level and start a YouTube channel, you're not just having a conversation with someone. You're sitting down in front of a camera, explaining things to the camera to potentially hundreds of people, thousands of people, millions of people, depending on how big your channel gets. And that can, for most people, that's even more pressure. But that more pressure is also even better. You're using the same skills that you use in conversations. You're organizing your thoughts. You're putting your ideas together. You're trying to explain things in a way that people understand. You're giving comments or using humor in a way that people enjoy, right? Uh, you're communicating effectively. You're communicating clearly. And hopefully people enjoy listening to you. Trying to figure out all of these things and say them in front of a camera is a, a, a very big challenge. So if you just jump into it, start somewhere, and then slowly improve, that's a lot better than never starting. My advice would be to first identify your subject area based on your interest or your expertise or both. Then don't, don't spend two weeks planning your first video. Instead of writing down every word, writing down a script, for example, just write down a basic outline, basic outline for your video on a piece of paper. 
an A, B, C, D. Basic structure, very simple. Then, if you have a nice camera, great. If you don't, you can use your phone, right? So, uh, make sure make sure you have the basics in place technically. Now, there are a lot of there are many levels to producing video, right? Um, for example, you know you can you can have a really nice camera and professional lighting and uh, all of that stuff. I mean, I, I probably I'm I'm not nearly at at the top of the level of of technical and as you can see uh, I am using a green screen right um, uh, and I have like six lights around me and a nice camera there uh, so but that's something that I had to learn over time how to figure out how to put all of that stuff together if you just sit down with your phone and point your camera your phone camera at yourself and talk that's great but I would recommend keeping quality in mind that means have a little tripod, buy a, a little stand that you can put your phone on so, so that you're, it's not like down here and it's going up your nose and everyone can see up your nose. It's a little distracting. So generally eye level and maybe have a, a, a simple background. Try to think about, about your background. A simple wall is okay. Uh, something that's clean that's not going to distract people. That's another, okay? And also you want to think about for lighting, if you don't have lights, use a window. You can sit by a window so that the window is in front of you, not behind you. If the window is behind you, then you're going to look totally black like an outline. And it's just going to, your phone is going to light the window and that's going to look weird. It'll be over, you'll either be overexposed, way overexposed, or you'll be totally black, totally, totally dark. So you want to sit so that the window is in front of you and probably to one side so that there's uneven lighting. That usually looks better than the window directly in front of you. Maybe it's, it's at a 45 degree angle right here. Just some of those basic things so that the video looks, looks nice and you're proud of it a year later. It's not, it doesn't you know, make you extremely embarrassed, right? So start putting out videos once a week. Make a schedule. Commit to it. I'm going to make a video every... Uh, Thursday, uh, I'm going to post it at 7 p.m. every Thursday and make a little schedule. And if you do that, you're going to find, you're going to discover aspects of yourself that maybe you didn't know you had. It's going to improve your uh, communication skills. It's going to improve your organization skills. You're going to get a better sense for the technical side. You're going to start building a community. You're going to be getting feedback from people. You're going to have that sense of pressure of people watching you, which is going to push you to improve your English, you're going to be using the skills that you need to have conversations, but at an even higher level because you're talking in front of a camera. And because you're talking in front of a camera, you gain confidence in presentations, which means at work, when you give presentations, you're going to be more confident. And as your following grows, you might start making money from your following just from YouTube ads. So there's so many benefits that I think everyone should at least attempt it. And I really do think that everybody knows something or is capable of talking about something that other people will value. Everybody. There's nobody who has nothing to say. And the most boring person in the world, that would be very interesting. Wow, the YouTube channel of the most boring person in the world? That's amazing. You're the most boring person in the world. How, do, how can that possibly be? So I, I even want to see a YouTube channel with the most boring person in the world. Everyone should try. So that's my pitch for starting a YouTube channel. And I hope you do. Esme, good questions. Thank you. If you need any other help or have any other comments about this, let me know. And uh, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And also check out my full courses in the links in the description. What days and what time do you go live? I don't have a regular schedule yet. I'm working on it, but I don't yet. I want to. I will. I will someday. <laughs> Hopefully this year. How about America getting underwatering? Oh, do you mean the, the flooding? Yeah, I live in New York where there are a lot of floods, but I live on the fifth floor, so I didn't have any issues. And I also live on a hill. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
Sorry if I missed any questions, but I want to... Gerardo says, um, confusing questions, the difference between... Oh, yeah, okay, talked about that one. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Curlin. I really appreciate that. Much appreciated. Sir, much appreciated. I recently finished reading this book, and I'd like to give a quick review of it, this book here. I'd like to give a quick review, and uh, I would ask you to consider picking it up if you want to learn more about, let's say, philosophy, but it's not just philosophy. It's the complete works of Michel de Montaigne. He was a French philosopher and so originally written in French, but I want to talk about the English the English version. It's called The Complete Works. And I recently read it. Uh, I recently read it in English and you might see the size of it and say, oh, not for me. Can't do it. Ah, uh, too thick. Well, don't worry about that. The cool thing about this and what I really liked about it is how bite-sized it actually is. You don't have to sit down and read it from beginning to end. You could open it up and find one of the essays. In fact, uh, Montaigne is considered one of the early pioneers of the format called the essay. An essay is on a specific topic, but it's a short written work on a specific topic. Not as long as a book, something like an article, right? And they're of varying lengths. But that's one of my favorite things about this is that it feels, each one of these feels quite unique to itself. And that makes the whole thing feel bite-sized because you could just read one and put it down and read one and put it down. So it might take you a while to read through them, but you could read them out of order. You can grab one uh, and then maybe come back to it later. That's, that's what's cool. And he writes about so many different topics so I want to talk a little bit about that, but um, if you're interested in general in in learning philosophy, and you, some people would dispute that this is philosophy, but there is philosophy in here. It's just that it's written in a way that's kind of uh, folky and um, uh, very personal and uh, very much sort of words of wisdom-ish that it sometimes doesn't sound like philosophy. But let's let's just call it that. So he has so many different topics in here in these essays. One of them is all about um, what he calls what he calls prim primitive people, which would be um, discoveries of uh, tribes where they're still where they're still eating people, where they're still engaging in cannibalism. And his attitudes towards these things are quite modern, in fact. He's very open-minded. He tries to really explore things with an open-minded an open-minded view. That's what I find very refreshing about Montaigne. He was writing a long time ago, and when the topic of cannibalism comes up, he says, well, I, mean, I, I guess I kind of think cannibalism is weird, but they probably think what I eat is weird. So maybe, maybe there is no such thing as weird. Maybe, maybe weird is just a relative term that people use when they're not used to something. I mean, that's a pretty, a pretty modern idea. Uh, and he often starts the, the title of the essay with of. For example, I'm looking at of the affection of fathers. That's one topic. Of books. Of cruelty. Let's see. What else do we have here? That one's kind of a long one. Of glory of presumption, of the greatness of Rome, of virtue, Caesar's methods of making war, the useful and the honorable, 
on some verses of Virgil of coaches. So he writes on so many different subjects and has a really unique, thoughtful, and open-minded approach for all of them. Now, of course, some of the things that he says are com completely outdated and totally wrong and just pretty, pretty strange from my point of view, but his thought process I find useful to follow. So even though he's, he's saying things often which are so far away from what I believe or what has come out in uh, the progress of science since his time, his way of thinking, the view he has of the world, I find very refreshing and for me uh, was very informative, especially his open-mindedness and his willingness to um, dismiss things or push aside things that seem difficult or inconvenient. Most people would really obsess over those things, and he just he has a way of putting it on the shelf and saying, ah, that doesn't really matter, actually. His approach to that is, is really interesting. He suffered a lot from uh, kidney stones, and he complains about it, but also in a way that's very entertaining. I find Montaigne to be hilarious throughout. He's very funny. He's very clever. He has a very simple and clear style of writing. It's not hard to read. It's not hard to follow. And uh, I gained a lot from it. I, it gave me a lot of, a lot of things to think about. Um, but I think, I think the number one thing is that he's just so open-minded. And especially for someone in his time to be that open-minded, uh, it's, it's quite refreshing. So if you want to uh, pick this up, I recommend it because, as I said, it's not that difficult to read. The, the English translation I have is by Donald M. Frame. And again, it's the complete works. And I think ideal for someone who's at that level of reading in English, who's working on their English, because it's so bite-sized. Don't be scared by the size of it. You can pick out essays here and there and read based on your interest and read it over time. And I think that's what makes it, uh, that's what makes it ideal for those of you who are learning English. Ha, yes, here's, here's the one that I was talking about. Of Cannibals. The essay is called Of Cannibals. Oh, and he also, another great thing is, he has many quotations here. So if he's talking about something and then there's a quotation from a famous philosopher or poet who he likes and respects from the past, like Cicero and Virgil and, uh, and many others, uh, Lucan, uh, Propertius, uh, Horace. He, he quotes a lot of people. So I also was able to pick up a lot of other people that now I would like to read. I need to read more Cic Cicero. I need to read Horace. Uh, and I need to read uh, uh, Lucan for sure, and some, some uh, Lucretius, and some of the others as well. So he he name drops a lot of people that he uh, that he has read, or that he's drawn his wisdom from, and in a way he's kind of passing along some of the wisdom that he's learned from these other authors who are from another another time, way before him. So uh, that's one thing. I've I've added a lot of books to my reading list just from the references that Montaigne makes throughout his essays. And they're, they're put in usually a, a really useful context. So he'll make a statement, he'll share his opinion, then he'll put in the quotation from whoever, and that will somehow reflect his meaning or add something to his meaning or change the flavor of his meaning, which I also appreciate. So uh, check that out if you like, or if not, don't. But I enjoyed it. Guys, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button, of course. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. And check out my full courses in the links in the description. Hmm. <clears throat> Is it correct to use the ing form after to be sorry? Um, like, sorry to make you wait? Sorry making you, making you wait? No, probably not. Probably not. I think no. 
But uh, I think the language of this is not too difficult for you guys to understand. I have never seen a father who failed to claim his son, however mangy or hunchbacked he was. I, I really appreciate your explanations. A question that I can't really find an answer yet is, I just started learning German. How to keep learning German while I'm trying to improve my English and French. Um, well, there's no rule that says you can't learn more than one language at the same time. Many people do it. Many people do it very successfully. So I would say keep just keep going. You can use different approaches for each one, but there's no... I don't think there's much to suggest that you can only learn one language at the same time. Many people learn multiple languages at the same time. Hey Luke, can guys and bud be used for girls? I've been correcting some boys who said those words for me, and that's what the uh, both used for male and female. Yeah, that's a good question. Naomi, hey Luke. Can guys and bud be used for girls? I've been correcting some boys who said those words to me, and all of them said that these two are used for both male and female. They can be. And again, it depends on who's saying it. I watch a podcast called the H3 Podcast, and the main host often has his wife there, and he calls her bro all the time. Hey, bro. 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 His wife. He uses bro for everybody almost. He calls his parents bro as well. Okay. I mean, some people want to do that. That's a feeling that of closeness, I guess, that, that he feels helps him express himself. Fair enough. Now, guys and bud. Bud is definitely more often used for men, as is bro, by the way. Bro is way more often used for men. Guys talking to each other, usually. Bud is often for older people talking to younger people. Hey, bud, what, what's up? A father might say that to his son. A father would rarely say that to his daughter, for example. Hey, bud, maybe, but I think it's much less common uh, to a boy. Boys to each other, bud, pretty common. Girls to each other, I, I, I don't hear that a lot. A boy to a girl, it, you can. It's not incorrect. So if someone feels, if that's the relationship. If you're really close and a guy calls a girl bud, hey bud, it's short for buddy, which is which means friend. Buddy means friend. And buddy, by the way, is not male or female. Buddy is just a close friend. It's just that more often, I think, I believe it's used among boys. But if someone, if you have a good relationship with someone and they said, hey bud, could you please do something to do that? Or, hey, bud, could you bring me? Or, hey, bud, do you want to go do that? If that's your relationship, I think that's fine. And it, there's no rule that says bud has to be used exclusively for men. I think it's just more often used that way. However, guys is very often used for both. Now, it's true that a guy, guy, a guy, if I said, hey, there's a guy over there, that is always a man. That's a man. Hey, th look at that guy over there wearing the dress. <laughs> that, that, that's a man over there wearing the dress. Okay. But when we're calling people out and we say, hey, guys, hey, guys, do you want to go see a movie? Hey, guys. Girls may say that to girls all the time, especially in America, but I think in the UK as well. Girls will say that to girls. Guys will say that to girls. Guys will say that to girls and guys. When I say girls and guys, I mean boys and girls. So when, I, when I'm talking about the genders and I say guys, the guys over there, if I'm speaking about their gender and I say girls and guys, that means girls and boys. But if I'm calling them, hey, you people, then say guys instead, then it could be either one. Hey, guys means everyone. So in a lot of YouTube channels, you'll see people start their videos. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Are they only talking to men? No. No. They're talking to everyone. 
and I've heard many girls say to just girls, only girls, hey guys, are you ready to go? They're all girls, so it's fine. Guys say that to guys, boys say that to boys, girls say that to girls, girls say that to, the, girls, say that to girls and boys, and boys say that to girls and boys. It's all good. It's just become so common in the language that uh, when you're calling people, when you want to get people's attention, when you're greeting someone, guys is ubiquitous and used in so many different situations and most often means everyone regardless of gender. But to be clear, when it's in reference to gender, those three guys over there, then suddenly it means men specifically. That guy standing on the bridge, that guy, that's a man. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. I hope that's not confusing. Uh, if you guys haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. And also check out my full courses in the links in the description. Okay, guys, I think we're going to call it a day today. Thank you all for joining. It's been great. Hope you have a good Friday. Stay safe. Have a nice weekend. Have fun. Um, do all the things you want to do. Uh, start reading. Read a book, whether it's Montaigne or not. And if I didn't answer your question, make sure you write it down and ask next time for next week. I'll be here next week, of course. And that's it, I think. I'm going to go uh, I'm going to go have some lunch, I think. That's what I'm going to do. Yes. Thanks for the for X2. Sure thing. Sure thing. All right. See you, everybody. Have fun. Have a good one. Uh, next week, probably Friday, we'll do another one of these Q&As. Uh, eventually, we'll get to regular a schedule. I know everyone wants a schedule. I want a schedule, too, but I can't have a schedule now just because of the all the stuff that's going on. But there will be. That is a promise in the future, a schedule. A lot of interesting things planned for live streams in the future. If you have ideas about that, let me know in the comments. Um, let me know what your ideas are. If there are things you want to learn about, that's fine. Last time I'll say this. Right now, the annual membership from my courses is on sale. You can click on the link in the description and you can get 20% off the yearly membership which means you get access to all of my courses for one year um, for that reduced lower price okay so check that out and i will see you guys next time bye bye